Your Steve Jones Show podcast is loading now. The Steve Jones Show podcast is sponsored by Sunbury Motors, North 4th Street in Sunbury, and Sunbury Motors Kia, routes 11 and 15 in Hummel's Wharf. This is the Steve Jones Show on News Radio 1070 WKOK. Now, from the Sunbury Motors Studio, here's Steve Jones. And today's show brought to you by Sunbury Motors, 4th Street in Sunbury. Sunbury Motors Kia routes 11 and 15, almost wharf and online at sunburymotors.com. Ford Kia Hyundai, the best in new inventory with great warranty. So important at warranty. Eases everything. Great pre-owned inventory with the Sunbury Motors guarantee, which is, again, easing the buyer experience. And a great service department backs it all up every step of the way. Routine, difficult to handle it all. That way, when it comes time to trade in for your next SMC vehicle, your vehicle, the one you're turning in, is in great shape. It's all at Sunbury Motors, 4th Street in Sunbury. Sunbury Motors Kia, routes 11 to 15, Hummel's Wharf online, sunburymotors.com. When you have a week between games, which is the story of football, you know, every once in a while I get a short week like Thursday night game tonight. But when you have a week between games and you have a situation with limited games, which you have this week with the college football championship games, And you then get a lot of talk and speculation as to how a playoff is going to play out based on the limited number of games this weekend. So the talk this week is all about what do you do with Florida State and what if Alabama beats Georgia? And this is where people start throwing darts. Now, Rodemaker is, is now the quarterback at, at Florida State. It's not Jordan Travis. That would play into this, in my opinion, if there were two, if there were five undefeated teams, not four. If Florida State wins the game on Saturday night against Louisville, they're in. They're not going to put a one-loss team ahead of a team that is undefeated. Okay? Right? They're not going to. How could you possibly put in a one-loss team over a team that every single week, including an extra week, has met the challenge? Okay. And I think that's important. I think that's important. This is what always bothers me about doing these shows. You know, and I've done this show. I mean, look, I started doing talk shows in 1983 and of course I've done the show on this station now finishing up our geez I guess we're finishing up our 12th year does that make sense we started in 2012 so we'll be finishing up our 11th year starting year 12 in February and
And th- th- for some reason, hot takes has replaced common sense on these shows. And, uh, you know, I'm, I don't know why. Maybe some people think it's more intriguing. I don't know. But I refuse to do that. Always have. I'd rather go from an area of common sense. Florida State wins the game. I don't care who the quarterback is. They're in the college football playoff. They're not going to get passed out by a one-loss team. It just it makes no sense. It may enhance the conversation. Hey, let's talk about what if if they win, they're in. Now, if there were five undefeated teams because they don't have their starting quarterback, that would be enough for me to put them out. But that's not the case. You're going to have a maximum of four undefeated teams. That's the maximum. Well, they're one of the four. And yes, they are going with their backup quarterback. Their starting quarterback is not coming back. But that doesn't matter. It's a team game. That would enter into it if there were five undefeated teams and somebody had to be the odd team out. That's now, you know, but that's not the case. There are four. Well, if they win on Saturday night, they're in. Done. Finished. If it ever came down to a an Alabama-Texas debate, Texas went to Tuscaloosa, won. We're finished. That's if they both have one loss. We're finished. We're done. You had your shot at home, didn't win, lost by double digits. Next. In fact, Alabama lost by a greater margin to Texas than Penn State had in its loss at Ohio State, which is single digits, and Michigan, which is single digits. Okay, Texas and Alabama lost to Texas. It was a double-digit game. And I watched the game, and it played like a double-digit game. They were just better. It doesn't matter. Well, it took place. Nope, we're done. It's college football. You get your shot. You had your shot. They won. Okay? Nothing left in the chamber. You have no worry. Well, we're playing. Nope. But we're playing much better. No. You had your shot. You didn't win. That's common sense. Easy. It becomes complicated, though, as the way you do with Georgia. Believe it or not. Well, the defending champion, that team isn't existing. Okay? We, oh, this is where many people in this business and fans make the mistake of, well, they're the defending national champions. Really? What kind of year is Jalen Carter having right now uh, for Georgia? What kind of year is Nolan Smith having for Georgia? What kind of year is Stetson Bennett having for... Oh, you mean, oh, they're not playing there anymore. Every year is a new team, and you are an entity unto yourself. If they lose to Georgia, excuse me, if they lose to Alabama, and Texas wins, and the debate is between the two, you have to sit down and say, well, wait a minute now. Texas beat Alabama by double digits in Tuscaloosa. You lost to them in the state of Georgia on a, quote, neutral field, but an hour from your campus. Which team do I pick if it came down to that? And it can't be the defending national champions. It's not the same team. That's called common sense. So that's where, when people ask me, and I was asked today by a group of friends, you know, where I thought they were going, I said, I, I don't know. <laughs> I said, I don't think anybody knows. All depends on how Saturday plays out. And uh, and that's... Um, That's where I sit back and I look at it and say, okay, hold on a second here. You can do all the hot takes you want, but I'm sorry, hot take. I, when the show's over, I want you to learn more about what's going on. 
I want you to be better informed when the show's going on. Hot takes do not better inform you. Not in the least. Most of it's speculation. That's what happens when you get into into this particular week with the playoff. Speculation. What if, what if, what if. And you know what? We have no idea how it's going to break. We know what Las Vegas says when it comes to the favorites. Early on, these conference championship games had some upsets that kind of shook things up. I remember Nebraska was great, 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 great. Texas won the Big 12 title game, and they got to the Fiesta Bowl against Penn State. It was like, wow, nobody expected that. But there really have not been many of those, quote, upsets in the conference championship games. They have pretty much pretty close have gone to form. What upset has there been in the Big Ten championship game? What's been the upset? There hasn't been a single upset in the Big Ten championship game. And I think it's pretty safe to say I feel strongly that uh, there will not be an upset in this year's championship game. One team has an awesome defense, but not enough offense to compete. That's simple. Louisville's a team I'm not crazy about. They're, they beat Notre Dame. Okay, well, great. Woo. That's nice. Notre Dame is a good team, not a great team. All right, so you beat a good team. That's good. It's a good win. Hey, do not pretend Notre Dame is any better than good. Okay? They are good. All right? They are not mediocre, but they are not great. They are good. So there you go. Take a break. Back with more in a moment. Doug Birdsong. What a pleasure this is this going to be to have Doug on the show at 1.30 today. Penn State Bucknell coming up Saturday at the Jordan Center. We'll talk with Doug in the next half hour here on News Radio 1070 WKOK. All right. Welcome back. Brought to you by Sunbury Motors, 4th Street in Sunbury. Sunbury Motors Kia, routes 11 and 15, almost wharf online, sunburymotors.com. And uh, once again, we're great to be with you on this uh, great day. It is, uh, we'll talk Penn State Bucknell basketball. Bucknell led Princeton at halftime last night. Shot better than 50% of the field. It actually is one of their better performances. Princeton has not lost this year. Um, and uh, Princeton was able to put together a run and won. Jack Forrest had another really good game last night. He had 21. He has been playing at a very, very high level. Um, so let's give. Jack Forrest, a lot of credit for what they've done. Uh, no, we're going to have Greg Murphy on. Instead at 135, Doug at 206. There we go, Greg. That's good. I'm glad Steve knows. Okay. Uh, oh, my goodness. All right. So I guess we'll talk baseball next half hour. Okay. Whatever. <laughs> All right. It's fine. Um the one million to two million number thrown out by Matt Rule and transfer portal quarterbacks. His point was to Nebraska fans, ah, we're not gonna do that. Um, basically saying they're not going to uh, um, pay to get a quarterback. They want to develop something internally themselves. Now, whether they can do it or not, I don't know. We'll, you know, we'll see. You look at the top ten teams in the country. Only two of the top ten teams in the college football playoff poll. Um have a transfer quarterback. Oops. Sorry. And um, and 
So you go with Carson Beck of Georgia, homegrown. J.J. McCarthy, Michigan, homegrown. It's the first time, really, that you've had a homegrown quarterback from Michigan uh, that's played for Jim Harbaugh. He's been going the transfer route for forever until he got McCarthy. I mean, yeah, Cade McNamara, sort of. right? But that's homegrown. Washington, transfer, Michael Penix. But again, Kalen DeBoer was his offensive coordinator in Indiana. Jordan Travis and the backup, Costemeyer, are both homegrown quarterbacks at Florida State. Oregon, Bo Nix, transferred Oregon from, uh, to Oregon from Auburn. But remember, his old quarterback coach, at Auburn, became the offensive coordinator at Oregon, and he transferred. And then he ended up getting the Arizona State job at the end of last season. So he helped t- turn him around, and then Will Stein stepped in, and Will Stein's done a great job with him. Ohio State, Kyle McCord, homegrown. And Quinn Ewers, well, he transferred. Yeah, he only transferred. He was going to go to Texas anyway. But because of the NIL laws and reclassification in Texas at the time, he went six months to Ohio State, then he went to Texas. So I don't consider him a transfer in because he was going to go to Texas anyway. It was only because of state law he ended up going to Ohio State for six months. All right? Jalen Milrow, homegrown. Okay? Brady Cook, Missouri, homegrown. Drew Aller, Bo Perbula, Jackson Smolick, all homegrown. So you look at the top ten teams – in the country, eight of them have their homegrown quarterback and only two have transfers. I don't think a lot of people realize that you can still develop your own people. I realize that a lot of programs are in that spot where they have to get somebody. and they want somebody with experience. I get that part. But at some point, stability means something, and that's why you're seeing the top teams have homegrown quarterbacks and not as many transfers. And even in the two transfers, I pointed out with Michael Penix and with Bo Nix, there were certain connections and circumstances that entered into the, the place they ended up. All right, Greg Murphy next. This is the Steve Jones Show on News Radio 1070 WKOK. Now, from the Sunbury Motors Studio, here's Steve Jones. Great to have you with us on the show today. And uh, let's uh, bring in Greg Murphy, brought to you by our good friends at Sunbury Motors, 4th Street in Sunbury, Sunbury Motors Kia, Routes 11 and 15, Hummel's Wharf, online at sunburymotors.com. Uh, Greg, welcome. Great to have you with us on the show today. Hey, Steve. Thanks for having me. Good to talk to you. Uh, okay. Uh, it's interesting. I was talking with uh, Dave O'Brien, who does the Red Sox, because he did the tournament in Orlando I did. Dave's great pro. And I says, hey, how things going up, up with the uh, with the Sox right now? He says, Steve, they haven't, he says, I don't know. I haven't made a single move yet. <laughs> so, uh, so the Phillies did make a move, and they re-signed Aaron Nola. Going into it, what did you think their odds were of getting him to stay as much as we know he wanted to stay? But, you know, the market is the market. So what did you think about how it played out? Yeah, you know, I – Obviously, there was there's no guarantee that uh, that Aaron was going to be back. But I do I do really think that uh, both sides genuinely wanted to make it happen. And when that's the case, as you know, Steve, in the world of sports, 
most times they can figure something out. Um, the initial numbers, they were pretty far apart, but in the world of compromise, uh, they were able to find a number that worked for both sides. You know, knowing Aaron the way that I do, and I've known him for years and years, I knew his heart was here. And if there was anything he could do to stay, uh, he would do that. And and I also talked to Dave Dombrowski once a week uh, during the season, and I knew how important it was to the organization to try and get Aaron back. So I, I was just happy that both sides kind of were able to look across the table at one another, decide that they both wanted to be part of this organization and, and, and have him part of the organization and make a compromise. And uh, that's the best way negotiations can work, and it's, it's great to have him back in the fold. And not only that, but it was how quickly it happened. There was no prolonged wait for this, and that tells me a lot about both sides and how committed they were to each other. Is that a fair assessment on my part? I I think you nailed it. I think that's exactly what happened. They both looked at each other and said, look, we we both want this to happen. What's it going to take? Boom, 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 boom. They get to it, and and it's uh, a done deal. So, yeah, I do think it says a lot about Aaron and uh, and his family, and it says a lot about the Phillies organization as well. All right, so now here's the next part. Last year, I think everybody felt going into it. If they could come up with a shortstop and move Bryson Stott over, boy, that would really help. And they signed Trey Turner. What do you see as the short-term and long-term needs of the Phillies based on how it played out this year? Well, I think, and you could probably say this about almost every organization in baseball, Certainly a little more depth at the starting pitching uh, um, situation would be great. Whether or not they can find somebody else, whether or not it's Yamamoto or uh, another free agent that's that's out there that they think can help. I mean, this Phillies starting staff is pretty darn good. It's one of the best in baseball. But as we saw, you can never have enough pitching depth. So if they could add someone in that role, um, I think that would go a long way. And honestly, you know, when it was all said and done, the biggest failure in the last, you know, week of the season was their inability to to get on base uh, and score some runs. So maybe an on base kind of guy um, that could they could insert in the lineup. The problem is, as you know, Steve, is there's not really a roster. Well, not so much a roster spot. There's not really a position uh, open to allow them to go out and, you know, last year shortstop was going to be open. So they went out and got what they believed was the best shortstop in all of baseball. Right. This year, every position is pretty much locked in and full. Um, so there would have to be some kind of moves that would have went along with it. I don't think that's going to happen. It's certainly possible. Anything can happen. And, and Dave Dombrowski sees an opportunity to make the team better, uh, and it involves the trade. I think he would pull the trigger in a heartbeat. But I think it's a lot more difficult this year to kind of fill that particular role just because there's no vacancy to be filled. I, I think that, you know you are who you are. I mean, Rojas is still the same player I saw when he played at Williamsport. All right? Mm-hmm. Still the same player. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's not that's not a knock, but it's just the way he plays. I almost feel like if they adapted a little bit to him, you know, let him bunt a little bit. Let him, you know, use his speed a little bit. He could be that on on base guy in the number nine hole, if they limited the the, sw- the swings and misses. Mm-hmm. I think that's a fair statement. I, here, here's what I think uh, we're going to see this spring training when we arrive uh, down in Clearwater in February. I think we're going to see Johan Rojas bunting a thousand times. Yeah, <laughs> over the course Agreed. of the spring. And, yeah. and I'm, I'm not really exaggerating. Um, right. They they need him to do that. And and I don't think he was very good at it uh, when he first came up to the big leagues. And for whatever reason, uh, that was not part of his game, or at least not a part of his game that, that anyone was really focusing on. And if he's going to be a big league player and an everyday player, that is what he's going to need to do. So I think we're going to see them spend an awful lot of time trying to, to figure out how he can get on base and because if he can get on base, he certainly can do what they need to do. And uh, so, yeah, I agree. It, it has to be part of his game the way the kind of player that he is. Because defensively, he is a gem. I mean, defensively, uh, he, incredible star. what he does. I mean, he, he take it's not just the speed; it's the routes he takes. He understands how to play really good defense. 
Yeah, uh, yeah. You really, you just have to watch them once or twice to see that, and uh, and and we saw that very quickly in Philly. Uh, you talked about starting pitching, which is was a great answer. Why is it when we get to that five spot? that we see more bullpen games now and people aren't developing a, a, a fifth starter, even a fourth starter on some organizations. Mm-hmm. Why is that? Because they can eat up some innings so you have a fresher bullpen. At least that's my thought. Your, what's yours? I'm, I'm in lockstep with you. If the question is a great one, the answer is a head-scratcher. I, I don't know why they're not. Um, you know, in the world of, of load management and and getting these guys and getting bullpens into games quicker and, and all of that, it has seemed to go, on, go by the wayside. Um, the, the need for five quality starters to try and give you six, seven innings every night. And I do think we're seeing the, the results of that, um, you know, late in the season. We're, we're, we're seeing guys burn out. We're seeing guys tired. And we're seeing bullpen games upon bullpen games. I mean, can you imagine 25 years ago, a bullpen game in the World Series. Uh, it yeah. it just you, you couldn't even fathom it, and no. and here we are. It's a, it's a regular thing now. Here's what I yeah. hope. I, I I hope it's starting to come back the other way. I mean, as you know, as as we were waiting to find out where Aaron Nola was going to be, every pundit, every baseball man, that woman that you spoke to, um, said, "Well, the great thing about Aaron Nola is he gives you innings. He gives you innings. He constantly yeah. shows up every five yeah. days, and he gives you." Well, okay, (laughs) yeah, Yeah. because he's trained his body that way. So perhaps it has to start in the minor leagues. It can't start in the big leagues. It has to start when these kids are 18, 19, 20 years old. And if if there's an emphasis to get that back into baseball, it can happen. It might take a couple of years. But um, I'd like to think that smart organizations are thinking about that. Yeah, Glavin, Maddox, and uh, Smoltz weren't missing a lot of starts. Uh, no. well, <laughs> ask yourself why. There's something that they were doing that that needs to be a – now, obviously they're exceptional athletes and, and well-trained, but still. Uh, now we've had an entire year with the rules. All right? So now we can at yep. least evaluate, you know, nearly 200 games worth of between the playoffs, spring training, and so forth, about 200 games worth. What do you think? For the most part, I like them. Uh, I think the the pitch clock had its intended – the result was what was intended, and that was to make the games go quicker and be a little bit more interesting. I mean, for a guy that watches 162 a year, um, there were days in 2016 and 2017 and 2018 where you're like, oh, my goodness, <laughs> is this game ever going to end? And, and I'm a baseball guy. I love it. Yeah, right. But let's be honest, it was getting it was getting boring. And I think Major League Baseball – despite all the pushback they got from players, and they're still getting that, um, they saw a need, and they then they did that. And, and I applaud them for that. I, I know it's not the purest form of the game with the clock. However, it's the same game that we watched when we were younger. So, yeah. to me, they didn't really change it. They just they're, – they're forcing it back to the way it used to be. So, I love that. Um, the shift rule, I love. I, I thought it would have a bigger impact, to be quite honest. I thought left-handed hitters were going to see their batting averages jump 20, 25 points, but yeah. we didn't really see that. But, but what we did see is more action, more ground balls getting through, more base runners, that kind of thing. Um, and in terms of the bases, and uh, that one to me is kind of whatever. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm sure someone out there could tell me that it had an effect somehow, some way, but... I'm not exactly sure about that. So yeah, I'm not sure either because I saw guys getting thrown out, and I also saw, I mean, you know, I'm watching Arizona, 54 stolen bases leads off with a broken bat, single doesn't move. Next right. game exactly. leads off the game with an error to Turner doesn't move. <laughs> like a sub point, I thought you stole 54 bases. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, and 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 that's because well, a big part of that is because the Phillies still have a catcher that can throw base runners out. JT, and so yeah. if you have a JT Real Muto on your team, you kind of negate that, or you or at least you you make them think a little bit more. So again, develop catchers that you know put a put some pride into playing defense the way JT Real Muto can and and maybe you know 
you're able to curtail that running game in that regard. And that's, again, that's the way the game's designed. That's the way it should be. Uh, you have some players where my toe hurts and I'm out for two months. <laughs> uh, then you then you have Bry, uh, Bryce Harper. Yeah. Uh, you're, around, you're around him every day. In reality, how sore, not hurt, but how sore was he as the season went because he was still coming off something incredibly major? And how much better can he be next season because he will be almost a year and a half removed from it? Yeah. Well, honestly, Steve, I'd be lying if I told you I have any direct knowledge, but much like you, I speculate and, and watch him go through his his work each day and, and go about his business. And I think to myself, man, he's got to be hurting a little bit, right? I mean, yeah. it, it's just yes. not natural to not feel the pain, but we didn't see it. Uh, and he certainly didn't talk about it, and he certainly didn't show it. And and that's part, just a small part of what makes Bryce Harper so special. So the second part of your question, how much better can he be? <laughs> uh, to me, the sky's the limit because he is that he's a, a generational kind of talent that um, that has a work ethic much like the greats of all time in, in any sport. And when you put all that kind of thing, all that together. You just never know how great they're going to be. He's already great, um, but can he do more? That wouldn't shock me. Wouldn't surprise me. And uh, that's only good news for the field. Castellanos had a great run at one point. Then at the end, he slumped. Uh, what do they need from him on a consistent basis, especially when the money's on the line? Yeah, I, I think it, much. You know, Nick being one of the players that that kind of suffered from that this year, probably uh, as much as anybody on the field, they they really need all of their guys to be more selective. And I know it's so easy for me sitting in the booth to look down and say, well, I'd swing at that pitch, right? right. I, sure. You know, I, I, I wouldn't have even seen the pitch. And, and these guys <laughs> are the best in the world. <laughs> right. Uh, so so I hate to, I hate to, to <clears throat> knock them, but but in the words of Dave Dombrowski, who is a lot better uh, judge of what needs to happen, he says the same thing. They just need to relax a little bit and see the ball better than they were seeing it late in the season. And and we saw each one of the guys kind of go through uh, a spurt where they, they struggled. Knicks was late, and um, and it cost the Phils. And, you know, Kyle, no different. Um, you know, he's a guy that uh, – they could swing and miss an awful lot, and uh, Trey <laughs> had his troubles early on. Yeah. So, you know, up and down the lineup, they're all such dynamic players. They all can hit for power. But if they have a knock, it's it's their inability to stop the chase. And that's really what they're going to have to focus on this year. And I, and I know for a fact that is exactly what they're going to try and focus on this year. I have not asked you about the bullpen yet. And a lot of teams that win – normally get that it may not be the career year but it's at worst their second best year out of like three or four guys in the bullpen. It's either a career year or their second best and that's why there's such great turnover in it. What's your confidence level in the Phillies bullpen and the depth of it moving forward based on the guys you see? My confidence level is pretty high and, and yeah. I would agree with your premise though. You kind of just never know with a bullpen I mean, you know, two years ago we watched Sir Anthony kind of dominate almost any time he took the mound. And then last year he certainly did not. Do I think Sir Anthony Dominguez can bounce back and be a dominant reliever again? Absolutely. He certainly has the stuff. So, right. you know, if they get another year out of Sir Anthony that we've seen in the past, they're going to be better in that regard. You know, Alvarado is another example of a guy that, you know, was hit and miss when he was in Tampa and has been, you know, pretty darn good here in Philadelphia. So, no doubt. The, yeah, the bullpen pieces, it's just, you just hope that you get guys having career type years in the bullpen. And I, and I know, again, Dombrowski's thought process with the bullpen and how important he believes it to be. And, and we've seen that since he's taken over, just how much better that bullpen has gotten. Um, he has, a, he has a knack for, for keeping a bullpen strong. So I think he'll make some tweaks back there. They've got a lot of young, hard-throwing, talented guys back there. <laughs> uh, in fact, they have a, a plethora of them. They have probably more than they need 
in the system. So that's what you want because if one guy's not going, you can switch him out, bring someone else in, and hope that he gets going. So my confidence level is pretty, pretty high that the Phillies bullpen will be among the National League's best once again. Well, my confidence level is pretty high. You're always going to give us great uh, talk, the things to discuss, so I always appreciate it. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. It's going to be fun. It won't be too long. Hard to believe. Well, it, it won't be too long, although, you know, I was out there with, a like, a huge parka on yesterday, so, <laughs> so I hope well, it gets here true. soon. And, and, and I was in Orlando last week, so, <laughs> so what the okay. heck? Oh, geez. Well, that's not good. Uh, yeah. Hopefully, come February, it's a little bit more uh, temperate down there, and and uh, we'll be ready to go. Greg, always a pleasure. Thanks a lot for your time. Really appreciate uh, you and all all the great work you do. Well, thanks, Dave. Always good to talk to you. Anytime. Greg Murphy joining us, Phillies Network. Yeah, a little hot stove on November thirtieth. It's always good. Like it. Uh, we'll take a break. We'll have Doug in the next half hour. Um, fact uh wait what was that segment that that greg did for us it was called was it diamond stories i think what the heck what was that segment called let's see suits send it to me because i remember we interviewed greg for that uh trying to remember what that because because roger's the one that came up with the idea uh let's see Let's see. It says, no. That's Doug. Let's see. I have all these emails from Suteroni here. Here's another one. Okay. Um, let's see here. Um, what the heck was that thing called? Because I know that he sent it to me. You sent me about 150 emails here in the last two weeks. None of them made sense. But what Doug and I are going to do is instead of doing diamond stories, Doug and I are going to do suit stories. This will be great. I'm looking forward to it. By the time we're done, he'll resign. What? (laughs) What? Oh, Caleb, don't roll your eyes. S-U-I-T, that spells suit <laughs> Here on News Radio 1070 WK, okay. Illustrated is named Deion Sanders as their 2023 Sports Person of the Year. Again, that's always under the category for me of like, who cares? <laughs> I don't care who the Sports Person of the Year happens to be. Uh, okay. I mean, you could have gone with. Kirby Smart, you could have gone with Dan Hurley, you could have gone with um, Kurt Signetti, by the way, is going to become the new Indiana football coach. He's going to leave James Madison to go to Indiana. Uh, And let's see, you could have gone with Bryce Harper, you could have gone with Bruce Bochy. You could have gone with, jeez, so many people you could you could think of that you could go with uh, along the way. You could have gone with Nikola Jokic. But they went with Deion Sanders. Now, they ended up 4-8. And let's face it, the article was had to be written before the end of the season. Did he energize college football? Yes. Did he energize Boulder? Yes. Did he energize the campus at Colorado? Yes. 
Um, was he a interesting and at times polarizing personality in the sport? Yes. Did he draw more people to watching the games? Yes. It's an interesting choice that will bring with it a lot of reaction. But he has been named the Sports Illustrated Sports Person of the Year, Deion Sanders. I can hear Matt now. He's, he'd be going crazy over this. You're listening to News Radio 1070 WKOK Sunbury. You can hear us anywhere in the world with the Sunbury Broadcasting Corporation app.